Hi, Assalamualaikum. My name is Muhammad Ashraf bin M. Razali from TBA 1145E. My student ID is 2019-202374. In this video, I will explain 3 years analysis on major economic countries namely United States, China and Russia by using two main indicators. The indicators are gross domestic products and inflation rate. The reason for the selection of these two indicators is GDP is an indicator used for a country to measure whether the country's economy situation is growing or recession. By using the theory, when there is an increase in GDP for a country, then it will show economy growth and vice versa. Inflation also has a positive relationship with GDP, where when GDP rise, the poor inflation also rise. This is due to the increased ability of individual to spend which increase the demand for goods and also show a reduction in terms of unemployment. The purpose of keeping inflation low is so that the cost of substance of society is not too high. Based on our study, the United States economy is at its best in 2018 and 2019. This is because the inflation rate increased slightly during the continuous increase in GDP. This factor show that the US has managed to control inflation well which can be seen as a good example for other countries. The factor that make GDP increase is US want to remain an economic influence which in just two years the trade war with China is heating up. Furthermore, China is no less impressive with a show of economic growth, which is a higher increase in GDP for two consecutive years of 6.7% for 2018 and 5.9% for 2019. Still, the shortage of China is based on the high inflation which throughout the three years China recorded inflation above 4%. The last economic country in our study was Russia. If seen the US and China, Russia is in weak performance due to a slight increase in GDP but a fairly significant increase in inflation because Russia experienced an increase in inflation of 2.9% and a 4.5% increase but GDP only increased by 2.8% and 2%. Both of these values represent 2018 as well as 2019. Our analysis that I emphasize the most is in 2020, which is the era of pandemic COVID-19. These three countries can be assessed with a good economic strength, which based on the study of GDP against the US and Russia, a decrease of 3%, while for China, an increase of 2.3% was recorded against GDP. China's shortage continued with an inflation only slightly higher. Conclusion China, US and Russia have economic strength which can ensure that the world economy can survive in global pandemic. And the effect can help all countries that trade with them. Malaysia is a trading partner to these three big countries that will receive a good impact. Impact not only in terms of trade but also trade opportunity which according to statistics of Southern Asia economy is the third largest economy. With the strengthening in terms of Malaysian government economy and social assistance. Company in the Malaysian economy will be able to continue their business and boost the country's economy where most of the leaders in the sector are performing well. Among the best companies in the sector or subsector, Lehan is the company that perform well in their subsector. So the potential for foreign investors to invest in the country and Lehan stock is high. That's all from me. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Shaira Karudin from BA1145E with student ID 2019275912 
and I will be enlightening on the regional economic analysis with the one main indicator which is gross domestic product. With this indicator, our country Malaysia, which is part of ASEAN market, can oversee the component movements of regional economy as this will help to see the marketability of our economy as well. Therefore, three ASEAN countries has become our benchmarks in our analysis, namely Thailand, Vietnam and Singapore. Based on GDP analysis, this newly industrialized country has grown by 4.2% in 2018. This performance was the most vigorous growth in six years and has made Thailand rank as the eighth largest economy of ASEAN. Based on data found, industrial and service sectors were the main contributions in Thailand's GDP by 3.2%. Export growth in Thailand is starting to recover from slowdown in the second half and a rise in foreign exchange. Meanwhile, in the year 2019, Thailand's growth expanded positively by 2.3% but at a slower pace from the previous year. As most countries were also affected by the trade tension of the global trade war, Thailand partially benefited from this conflict as US and China depended on substitution product and took advantage to relocate production bases to Thailand. It has proven that exports have contributed 60% of the country's GDP. As expected in the year 2020, the crisis of COVID-19 affected Thailand to experience a contraction of 6.1% due to the supply chain disruptions with domestic consumptions and decline in external demand. For 20 years, Vietnam's economy was among the worst in the world. But that changed in 1986 as a new economic system and politics was formed along with the goal of transforming their country into a socialist-oriented market economy. Its economic growth is comparable to China's at 6 and 7% because its exports are worth more than the country's entire GDP. It is said that Vietnam successfully transformed their country from the poorest nation to a lower middle income country. In 2018, Vietnam's GDP grew up to 7.1%. This is mainly due to, to the strong agrarian base with agriculture export of rice, coffee, black pepper that Vietnam had since 2008. However, agriculture's contribution to GDP has been declining while the country's industry sector has undergone a significant expansion. It has been completely protected by the information technology industry as well. Vietnam's GDP increased by 7% in 2019 owing to processing and manufacturing which were the pillars to the growth with 11.29% along with the industrial and construction sector and also service which grew at a rate of 8.9% and 7.3% respectively. In 2020, GDP rate fell to 2.9% where a huge loss occurred aligned with the global economy due to COVID-19 crisis. However, Vietnam still managed to remain positive in GDP as Vietnam is known for multi-export commodities and merchandise. Singapore's GDP increased at 3.5% in 2019. The electronics, transportation engineering, and biomedical manufacturing sectors were the main drivers of the growth. Meanwhile, in 2019, Singapore remained positive in growth but slightly slower growth rate which stood at 1.3%. Other ASEAN countries may have benefited positively from lengthy trade war between the United States and China but it is not the same case for Singapore, especially in the electronic sector which definitely had an impact on the export-oriented economy. This is mainly because Singapore is a small open economy that used to benefit from both countries but it is in a verge of situation of picking sites of which telecommunication system to be installed in Singapore. In that year, the GDP growth was likely supported by services and construction sectors balanced with manufacturing. In 2020, Singapore also impacted negatively to the crisis of COVID-19 with a negative growth of 5.4, but is now in economic recovery aligned with the region and world economy as well. To conclude, ASEAN market in 2018 and 2019 were showing good growth. It can therefore be said, if the momentum continues, the ASEAN economy can provide excellent competition with other countries. 
Unfortunately, the economic downturn which occurred in 2020 impacted negatively on the country's economy but only one still remains positive, which is Vietnam. This situation shows that the ASEAN economy is weakening, but at the same time, other countries' economies outside ASEAN are also compromised. It is believed that ASEAN, which is known as the Asian Tiger Economics and Trading Region, will rise back up stronger as it has already proven a growth rate of 3.1% in September this year. Since Malaysia is also a member of ASEAN, Malaysia is also expected to strive stronger along with the other. With this being said, if ASEAN able to continue its growth momentum, this will directly promote ASEAN countries, especially Malaysia, to the global investors in the furniture industry, as it has the potential to capture the global market with its unique and high-quality rubber wood. From here, investors may directly be able to see Lihan's potential in the market since Lihan is a major furniture company in Malaysia that could bring a profitability return. That is it from me. I hope my explanation is crystal clear to you. Thank you and goodbye. Assalamualaikum and hi. My name is Wandanya Farzana binti Wan Muhammad Hamza Nilaisha Rizal and I'm from BA1145E. I will be presenting on Malaysia's monetary policy. From here, we can see that the rate declines from 2018 to 2020 where the overnight policy rate of 2018 is 3.25%. As for 2019, it is 3% and following with 1.75% for year 2020. The Malaysian government controls the country's monetary policy through modifying interest rates and money supply. The Bank Negara Malaysia would determine monetary policy based on various economic conditions. For example, inflation or recession by increasing or decreasing interest rates. By doing this, it can achieve the macroeconomic objectives. As a result, monetary policy will have an impact of the country's aggregate demand and in terms of three components, such as consumption, investment, and net export. Malaysia also uses the statutory reserve requirement in their monetary policy. It is an effective liquidity management tool. The statutory reserve requirement might be raised to deal with a major buildup of liquidity that could cause financial imbalances and put financial stability at risk. However, in 2019 until 2020, the statutory reserve requirement remains unchanged at 2%, which the measure released approximately 16 billion ringgit worth of liquidity into the banking system. Moreover, Direct borrowing uncollateralized through open tender is also one of the most common monetary tools used. In 2019, the policy on tender has been refined to improve on the quantum limit, pre collocation and graduation system that Datuk Sri Mukhlis Mohadi designed. They must set a quantum limit whereby any project above a certain value must be done through an open tender. Let's take this simple policy for an instance where all procurement supplies and services above 1 million ringgit must go through an open tender. There will be no negotiated tender except for projects below 1 million ringgit. The bank also may arrange a foreign currency swap as another method of absorbing or injecting liquidity. In a foreign currency swap, the bank either buys or sells the ringgit against a foreign currency and carry out the opposite transaction at a future stage. By stimulating the price transaction, the process will be comparable to lending or borrowing in the interbank market, which is sale. In 2018, Malaysia's foreign currency was recorded at 4.04%, which decreased dramatically from 2017, where the rate was 4.3%. As for 2019, it increased to 4.14%. A year after, which is the year 2020, it almost reached the percentage as near as 2017's, which was 4.25%. We can see that Malaysia's currency declined in 2018 but kept rising in the following years. According to Bank Negara Malaysia, the Monetary Policy Committee is expected to set the overnight policy rate at 1.75% in 2021. However, the percentage are smaller than in prior years. Compared to three years ago, the overnight policy rate was 3.25% in 2018 due to the 0.97% of inflation. The goal of Bank Negara Malaysia was to actually keep track and analyse the risk which surrounded the forecast of domestic GDP and inflation. In 2019, 
The overnight policy rate was still an accommodating and supportive towards economic growth in order to ensure that the environment stays conducive for a long-term growth while maintaining price stability, the Monetary Policy Committee will continue to consider the balance of risk to domestic growth and inflation. In 2020, Malaysia's overnight policy rate was 1.75%. Malaysia addressed its implications on the overall forecast for inflation and domestic growth was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In this case, the bank would use its policy levies as a necessary move for a durable economic recovery. In conclusion, Malaysia's Monetary Policy Committee is currently on the right track. As an evidence, Malaysia knows how to regulate the pace of inflation and domestic growth every year appropriately and precisely. Not to forget on the number of overnight policy rates from year to year as well. This also indicates that Malaysia is able to effectively control inflation and improves in economic development. That is all from me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sani Sadrana Binti Adnan from TBA 1145E. My student ID is 2019227122. And in this video, I'll be presenting my group's industry analysis of Malaysia with our chosen industry in order to help in our investment decisions. First things first, you may ask, what is industry analysis and how is it done? Well, industry analysis is a study of industry grouping that requires us to look at the competitive position of a particular industry compared to others, as well as identifying companies within the promising industry. Moreover, industry analysis can be done by looking at its basic characteristics, such as the operating variables that drive the industry's performance, the outlook of the industry conditions, market dominance of a company within the industry, and so on. Therefore, the components of industry analysis that we'll be looking at in this video are the profile of our selected industry and the competitive position of the companies under our selected industry. So, following the first component, the profile of our selected industry, which is furniture, it is a sector that contributes to Malaysia's gross domestic product even with the negative effects of COVID-19 when the sector went through a downturn in terms of its supply and performance in 2019. However, the furniture sector still managed to bounce back to recovery in 2021 where the exports of the furniture sector hit a value of RM6.6 billion. The demand for the products under this sector not only remained but also took a jump. This is due to the fact that even with the ongoing pandemic, people are still required to work from home, thus the demand for office furniture to be put in their houses increased. Moreover, the current situation of students having to go through online classes from home is also contributing to the jump in demand for house furniture. Furthermore, the analysis done on this sector was also because Malaysia's furniture products have made a major growth in exportations globally, which resulted in our country being one of the top 10 largest furniture exporters in the world. One of the factors that enables the furniture sector of Malaysia to reach this milestone is due to our country's rich supply in natural resources and raw materials. In addition, the backing factor of the furniture sector is also convincing. We have gathered that, according to MTIB's Senior Assistant Director, the best way to develop the furniture industry in Malaysia is to change the wood-based products from OEM to ODM and OBM. This is because the approach will allow local furniture designers to be supported in their ventures to close the gap between designers and manufacturers. Therefore, MTIB has taken a step into introducing local wood species to Malaysia's young designers to process the resources into high-value added products. Therefore, even with other promising industries, we decided to look into furniture because of the prospect of the industry where we believed it has a potential profitability. To support this claim, we have gathered that the government is taking initiatives to further prosper the growth of this sector. For instance, most generic products have changed into being branded products in efforts to drive Malaysia's products into the global market. To top it off, the Plantation Industries and Commodities Ministry has reported that Malaysia's wooden furniture exports are expected to exceed RM13 billion in 2021. That will be an increase of exports value compared to the previous year where RM12.8 billion was recorded. Hence, this further shows the potential of the furniture sector despite the complications of COVID-19. Now that we have identified the competitive position of the furniture industry, we looked into the companies under the furniture subsector and gathered a total of 19 companies. 
After calculating and analyzing the market size and market share of the companies, we have found that Li Han Industries carries the largest market capitalization of RM540 million, thus ranking it first out of all 19 companies. Therefore, it's no surprise that Lihan Industry also represents the largest percentage of the subsector's market share at 22.52%, with the revenue recorded of RM9315580000 in 2020. This makes Lihan the leader in the Finnish industry and it also shows the demand for the company's product is higher compared to its competitors. Therefore, we have decided for Lihan Industries to be our main stock and target to further run our top-down analysis while Jacob Berhardt as our main competitor. That is all from me. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Nuri Fatih bin Dikamarifin. Let's go on the study of company analysis. We have picked Lihan Industries to the number head as our company, which is a furniture subsector company where it categorized under the consumer product and services sector. This company is fully guided by Li Min On as a chairman. Based on profit data and income throughout the pandemic season, Lihan Industry has succeeded, become a stabilizer of the Malaysian economy. Additionally, Li Han's market has been able to break into the international market where it comprised catering to the market of North America, the Middle East Asia, Latin America, Europe, and Australia. Moving on to the fine point of this video, we'll discuss about SWOT analysis of a company. To begin, the strengths of this company, first, each organization has its own field and constantly prioritizes the demand as well as product quality that they produce. Due to the company's closeness, they have greater and stronger control over movement and materials flows which it is reducing any disturbance. Even in roof markets, Lihan remains less volatile as most investors focus on a company's quality and stability to avoid becoming risk adverse in their investments. They also pay a significant dividend to its shareholders which is fully funded by the company's revenues and cash flows. Lihan had a distinct advantage and strength in that it guaranteed, guaranteed that all of the group's supplier companies had a steady supply of raw materials and were self-sufficient in raw materials during the COVID-19 epidemic. This company showed its power by earning RM931.6 million in sales. Furthermore, for the company weakness, Lihan Industries' Sedan Berhad was reckless in taking care of its employees held in 2020, particularly during the COVID-19 epidemic, and this had an influence on the company's operation and financial performance. Moreover, the supply schedules of furniture manufacturers and a lack of shipping containers were also impacted by these circumstances, resulting in a dramatic rise in shipping and containers costs that continues to this day. Moreover, as a big company, Lihan won't miss an opportunity in collaborating with other companies. Lihan Plantations in Number Height and PPL Plantations in Number Height, a joint venture company with PIJ Holdings in Number Height, are collaborating in the planting of 3473 hectares of rubber plantation in Johor. Based on possibility provided by this company, this project enables Lihan to grow its market not only in the furniture industry, but also in the field of planting. Furthermore, because of the strong demand for furnitures during the epidemic, Lihan has been able to expand their manufacturing in order to fulfill market demand. Finally, the COVID-19 level shortage, foreign currency exchange rates, rivals and raw materials availability and pricings are all risks to this company because 97% of Lihan Industries' products are exported globally particularly to North America. As a result of the restriction movement or the RAO, global trade activities have come to a halt and this has negatively impact the company's business performance. Another concern that the corporation anticipate during the pandemic is the risk of virus infection among its staff. In fact, on December 23, 2020, the group 
reported their first incident of COVID-19 impacting other foreign workers. Another potential threat is a labor shortage, which is a major concern as well as the furniture sector as a whole. This is as a result of changes in government policy on foreign employees. The foreign currency exchange rate is also a threat to the company. As previously noted, Lihan Industries is heavily involved in global exporting, exposing the cooperation to foreign currency risk on sales or purchase made in currencies other than RM Malaysia ringgits. Further, the volatility and unpredictability of the US dollar against the RM. The various Lihan earning company performance, financial situation and liquidity. As a rival, Jacob Braha offered a challenge to Lihan industry as Jacob engaged in a variety of industries including furniture, investment, holding, biomass and packaging. The availability and cost of raw materials pose a threat to Lihan industry. Since Lihan's finest products are primarily made of wood which includes solid wood, veneers, MDF, plywood, pine wood and more as well as additional materials such as finishing materials and cartoon boxes and it obtains the raw materials from vendors with no long-term supply agreements. This is posing a threat to the company and any disruption to the supply chains caused by the third parties will have an indefinite impact on the company's capacity to meet market demand. As a result, raw materials availability may be an issue for organization. Finally, every business has its own sets of weakness, strengths, opportunities, and traits. However, it's all normal, but the important things for them to consider is how they will face and resolve all of these issues in their company. That's all from us. Thank